suffering. It's suffering. And it's suffering that um, is excessive, gratuitous, um, didn't have to happen that way. Um, but more, the, the, to me, the, the really damaging aspect of trauma, whatever it might be, is not um, the trauma itself. I don't know, the earthquake, the illness, the abuse, whatever. But it's the way the, uh, the surround deals with, with it. Right. That that's that's what's really important. You know, if there's a if there is a receptive, supportive adult, let's just say adult mind to say, whoa, wait a second, this is not right. Um, you've been hurt. Shouldn't have happened. Let me help you. What can I do? That's a, it's, it's huge. It's hugely different than I don't want to hear about it. Again, I think about it as pain. I think about it as suffering. I think about it um, as things that leave a mark, that, that, that lay down tracks, lay down tracks in the body, lay down tracks in the unconscious. Um, the, the suffering and the hurt that happened at a stage where it could never be put into words, but it's felt in the body. Uh, and it, um, it just, it, Freud had a term, the shadow of the object, right? It casts a shadow over a life. And so the world is interpreted constantly in various ways in terms of the trauma or series of traumas or just a toxic atmosphere of whether it's ne neglect and abuse in a household or political oppression or war or living in a refugee camp or, right? So whatever, so... I don't start off with a theory of trauma, but we talk about it from that point of view. Uh, and then through, through texts, um, from different, as much as I can, from different cultural settings where individuals talk, but you also get a sense of the historical, political, cultural situation. Um, in some religious texts, like one of the texts we, uh, Two texts. We, we look at the, uh, one in this one course, take the binding of Isaac, right? And that's a very powerful and remains a very powerful um, kind of theological religious text in the West uh, that's meant to attest to the faith of uh, Abraham, right? And we know what Kierkegaard wrote about it, or the crucifixion, right? When Jesus says, Abba, Daddy, why have you, you know, so then we talk about this. So what are the messages that a tradition conveys? What do children hear in religious settings about this kind of thing being a good thing? Or the Syrophoenician woman, you know, when uh, Jesus says, why should I feed? Why should I feed the, the dogs when the children have not yet been fed? And the way she has to accept his racist uh, response. And but even the dogs get crumbs so she can have her child. So I'll say to the students, imagine you've got a sick child. You've got a sick child and there's a doctor. There's a doctor person around and that person can help your child. You would object yourself pretty far, don't you think, to help your kid? So I try to ask those kinds of questions. You, again, you gotta, be, you gotta be careful because um, students who come from traditions that value these texts and uh, have accepted, you know, them in certain theological ways, you have to be careful not to hurt them. I mean, they're going to maybe be hurt or offended. So it's, it's just, you know, very well as a scholar of religion, it's just very tricky. So that's the way, that's the way I do it. I do it. But I guess the question is, what is the trauma? What were the conditions that produced it? To what degree are those conditions supported and reproduced by the society in question? Right? How is the impact viewed? Is the person viewed as crazy? Do we go to the DSM-5? Do we go for an exorcism? Like, you know, so there's a lot of issues, depending on what it is we're actually looking at. Um, yeah. Uh, 
in the last well, two years now, I take the view that everybody is traumatized by the pandemic. Everybody is. And uh, everybody's hurt. In my clinical work, I noticed that um, things, let's just say, anxieties or nervousness or insecurities that pre-pandemic would, wouldn't be all that undermining. Sometimes they really flare up. People are not able to go to work or, you know, it's... So I was actually teaching the graduate course on, uh, on mourning and trauma. So this, the class was, what was there, 14 students, I think, from all over the world. And some of these students were really isolated. So the first thing I did was to acknowledge the situation that we're in and to take the first 50 minutes of the class, 10 to 50 minutes of the class, having a check-in. Nobody had to say anything, but anybody who wanted to just, how are you doing? How is this for you? How are you doing? Oh, I mean, one person would go days without talking to anybody. This was in the, the last spring, a year ago spring, uh, no, fall. Another person, a single parent, um, was trying to, she kept having to leave the class so that she could go to the other room because she had two kids online with school. So she had to keep leaving and going there. She kept apologizing, I kept saying to her, it's, it's okay, it's okay, you do what you have to do. And then in the pandemic, let them talk about how it is for them. And it was really, really important. And they said, at the end of the class, all of them said how important it was for them and how they felt, they felt connected um, with each other. And they felt that, um, they felt they had a kind of a community that was a bit more than an academic community. And we got through all the material. We got through everything. And that was, I was really pleased about that. I had a student, I had a student a few years ago, before the pandemic, it was the first class, and she came to see me, the TA was there, thank goodness, and a few other students were there, and her friend, and she was asking me a question about assignments and papers, and I talked to her about it, and I noticed she was pretty distressed, and she started telling me a story about when she was in high school, uh, she wrote something, and the comments of the teacher were really humiliating, like really bad. Then she started to have a panic attack right in front of me. And she was like, couldn't get her breath and you, you know. Um, so I walked up really closely to her and I asked her, I said, can I put my hands on your shoulders? Can I touch you? And she said it was okay, and there was a lot of people around, so that was good. We have to be careful about that, right? So I just put my hand on her shoulders, and I talked to her really gently. I said, look at me, just look at me, look at me. And she looked at me, and she's kind of, and I said, it's okay, and you know, whatever, and everybody. And she calmed down, she calmed down, and she was okay. And I asked her, was she okay to leave? And I asked her friend to make sure her friend went with her, and I suggested that maybe her friend take her for lunch, make sure she got some food in her and water in her. And she left. I never saw her again. And I often wondered about her and why I didn't see her again. Did she feel so embarrassed she couldn't come back? Did she... I, I think of that student for some reason. I think of her a lot. Did she stay in school? Did she... And what that... What happened with that teacher? I mean, who knows what... But that's what she, that was her experience. So something happened and it wasn't good for her. And it came out in that moment. And it came out in the moment when the TA and I were reassuring her, look, if you need help writing, we're here, we can, then it, you know, it, it's very, uh, I don't know, I felt bad for her. I love my work and I think if you love your work, then you love every aspect of it, and that includes students. So if you love your work and you love teaching, then you probably love your students. 
um, I miss them. I, I tell them that. I tell them, I say, I really miss you guys. I've never met them before. It's not about them so much even as individuals in that way. So I think, I think students, like everybody else, respond when they know they're cared about. I think they do. I think if students feel or get the sense that they have a teacher who, you know, beyond wanting to get the material across and all that, they have a teacher who cares about them and listens to them and respects them and tries to work with them. I think that, I think that goes a long way. I hope they know that. I always hope my students know that. I hope they know that uh, I care about them. Um, I, I don't have anything more brilliant to say. That's all I can say. It comes across.